gepasst. Thanks, Bill. Come on. All right, it looks like we are recording. So I will introduce us because that's what I'm supposed to do. Welcome to the show with no name. I am your host, Panyo Basa, also known by other names. And this is my honored guest, Numa, who also goes by other names. So how's it going? Uh, can't complain too much. It's 90 degrees outside and it's nice and air conditioned in here. So the joys of modern comfort. Hmm, for our European viewers, we're talking Fahrenheit here. Oh, yeah, right. You do have some uh, European and uh, maybe some down under viewers. Yeah, barbarians that haven't switched over to the, the foot and then the Fahrenheit system yet. Yeah. So, um, here, I want to make sure I get this right. So, Numa is uh, a well educated, well read sort of person who has taken an interest in Western es esoteric traditions, Platonic philosophy, and ancient pagan religions and is also somewhat of an occultist. And so we are going to talk about modern paganism, neo-paganism in the West, especially that of a more classical nature, probably not so much emphasis on the Germanic type that a lot of people just identify with paganism in the West, or not so much Celtic, but um, I assume based on previous conversations that you're more interested in like Greco-Roman, maybe some Egyptian, you know, just like, you know, classical paganism rather than, you know, Thor and, and Wotan and that sort of thing. Yeah, you could say that. I mean, my interests have been kind of spread into sort of different areas. I get into one and study one and go to the next. But yeah, the class, the whole classical thing is sort of how I got into it. And in, in the first place, I was interested in philosophy and history. And obviously, you know, when you get into that, you get into the Greek mythology. So it's kind of a natural in, entry point into kind of studying, we would say, classical pagan systems. So what was it that really interested you? I assume it wasn't just uh, the stories of the gods and goddesses. Oh, well, I'm really going back here. What got me interested in the whole thing? Um, I, much of my early life, I really had no interest in much of anything metaphysical or religious or anything. I grew up pretty secular. And it was kind of like a bunch of random interests kind of just had me stumbling into this whole area. Um, yeah, I was into philosophy one day all of a sudden and then, you know, surveying different religions and and whatnot. So and then, yeah, I wanted to kind of learn about it, everything. And, you know, I've surveyed Eastern traditions, too, quite a bit. So I like to kind of con compare and contrast and sort of see what sort of um, insights and doctrines things have in common, you know, and what to try to suss out truth from from like many different and traditions. Yeah, I think we have that in common. I've, um, you know, I've, I've studied a lot of Western philosophy, not like a god awful amount, but, uh, you know, sort of, um, I have a, a general working knowledge of what Western philosophy is all about. And um, I really didn't find much of in like ancient Greek philosophy. I, I, I really like the Stoics and the and the Cynics. Like Diogenes is my hero before I discovered Eastern philosophy. But um, you know, a lot of Greek philosophy, at least if you're reading like introductory works, you know, of Greek philosophy, you know, they're they're arguing back and forth about, you know, what is the elemental substance? And um, right. if they go into greater detail, it's it's Plato and Aristotle mostly. And I really am not a fan of either. So, I mean, I tried reading uh, Plotinus' Aeneads when I was a young man, and I just didn't have the attention span for it. So, <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, that really is kind of the magnum opus of what we could, would call Western idealistic philosophy or Neoplatonism, which is kind of a modern scholarly term for, for that. But that does sum up kind of, I, it seems almost like the apex of, of Western thought before uh, Christianity hit the scene and took everything over. Yeah, pretty much kicked everything else in the head. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Which is unfortunate. I mean, it, 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 that strikes me as a tragedy that all of the indigenous European spiritual systems 
were either persecuted to death or subsumed in in like um what's the word uh camouflage form into christianity yeah they had to really sneak their way through like um uh, the best example would be the whole like uh, celestial hierarchy of angels we see in the more mystical end of Christianity. That was basically the that was the Neoplatonic philosopher Proclus wrote this just massive encyclopedic work on the sort of the celestial hierarchy. So then there was this Christian monk named Pseudo Dionysus who basically just took Proclus's work, etched out the names of the gods and replaced them with angels, and therefore Christianity suddenly had this very uh, uh, vibrant angelology in its, its in its doctrine. Oh, really? I heard a different version about uh, the pseudo Dionysius that he actually was a Neoplatonist, and then when the emperor, what Theodosius or somebody, or was it Justinian, where they just shut down the, the yeah. Greek philosophical schools, you know, it's like if you can't beat them, join them. So he he joined the Christians and uh, just brought his Neoplatonism with him. And yeah, know, actually, uh, I. I wouldn't doubt that if that's actually what it what did happen, that's probably right. So I have a, a few questions. I mean, we're going to just give sure. a kind of an overview of, uh, you know, what kind of stuff you're you're, um, you know, studying and practicing, and um, you know, just to give a general idea before we get into the decline and fall of of paganism in the West. And one right. th one thing I was wanting to ask you is, I mean, on what would uh, like classical pagan ethics be based on? Is it just going for ataraxia, just peace of mind, like the like the the Pyrrhonistic skeptics and and like the Stoics, or is there like a higher, you know, a higher source of ethics other than just human psychology? Yeah, so again, it, de it depends on the tradition, really. Um, the, the proponents of the different schools argued back and forth endlessly, and they, they shared some vocabulary, but there were really kind of different things. That, so as you're, as you're familiar with Stoicism, the metaphysics in there is pretty minimal, but um, I guess what you could say that shares with Platonism is this idea of a providential cosmos and a, a big G God, which by the way came before Christianity just appropriated this whole thing. But so all the intellectual classes of Rome were in Greece were talking about the big G God before Abrahamism took yeah, it and kind of did its own thing with it. I suppose. Yeah, well, <laughs> they're they're the one everybody loved to beat up. Everybody beat up on the Epicureans. The Platonists didn't like them. The Aristotelians didn't like them. The Stoics didn't like them. Especially the Christians didn't like them for obvious reasons but yeah they were um the epicureans were the most atheistic i guess you could compare them it was like in the schools of hinduism where you had the one i forget the name of it but you know there's like the six classical schools of hindu yeah, thought the they were one of them. yeah they were like the overtly atheistic one and i think everybody yeah. kind of just beat up on them yeah yeah the char they, they are uh compared to the charvakas of ancient india right, right. right. You know, they were like you know it's like ethics is just kind of bullshit and you know, it's like it's atoms, you know, this sort of a what it what is it, Democritus? You know, they had the, the idea right. of just everything is just matter and, and when you yeah. die, you're dead and that's it. And so. yeah, atomism, though they tried to um, even Epicureanism was still less materialistic than what materialism is today. So they try to explain non physical phenomena. They would call it like some invisible filmy substance. And I think that the Stoics might have had something a little more sophisticated than that in their explanation. So they, they try to explain non-physical things, but they really like try to be materialist as possible. Yeah. And I assume just the goal of philosophy also, other than just living a good life, would also vary from, from school to school. I'm just uh, curious yeah. of, uh, what you have gleaned from your studies of classical paganism and you know which which you would prefer which you would be going with so yeah i, I obviously i inc personally incline more towards platonism i i at the same time i don't go all the way and just like fully identify it's my not my own thing is just to like totally get you know use like a philosophical school as an identity and then suddenly i find myself having to be like a representative of it and like being an apologist for its doctrines I always maintain you know a little bit of an open mind and the realization that just humans are not that smart or sophisticated, and there's a lot of things that we really just can't be sure. So I kind of leave a little bit of the, the, the skepticism open. 
but w while recognizing what I believe to be a divine overarching reality and the existence of non-physical beings that are much wiser and more powerful and obviously more advanced than human beings. So like a, a cosmos just furnished with a lot of different things that are not necessarily human oriented. So yeah, I incline towards Platonism. I like reading about the other schools too. You mentioned Ataraxia as kind of one, that's sort of like one top tier goal. And I think in the, in the schools you read about, there's another term eudaimonia. That was a big term that was used by a lot of the Greeks, which basically just literally means good spirit. So yeah. it's a, like you're attaining some kind of higher spiritual state. And it's kind of a vague word, different schools interpreted it that term in a different manner. I think the Stoics used the term a lot in particular. And, and similarly, the, the Platonists had a term called uh, agathos, which means the good, good or the good, really. That's what it means. So the good is like the highest apex of, of, of Platonism, which they uh, associate with the concept of the one, which is like the one is basically like Brahman in, in like the various Vedanta schools. Yeah. So, um, like Buddhism and also ironically uh, Epicureanism, you know, they accept the existence of small g gods and may uh, approve of at least honoring them, having respect for them, but it's not really a, a theocentric kind of, of spiritual right. system. You know, it's like they, they have their own lives to live. They really, as a general rule, don't care much more about us than we would care about ants in a vacant lot behind the house, you know. Yeah. Whereas, I mean, generally we, we consider uh, classical paganism to be, you know, propitiating the gods in order to get something in return. Yes, that's true. So within classical paganism, that would be like really like deep, the old deep classical paganism before uh, before philosophy kind of like actually rewrites the theologies here. And so a good example would be in the later, like in Neoplatonism actually develops a very different view about the gods. And you can read this in some of the writings of basically the thinkers that came Plotinus and after. Uh, particular Porphyry Porfer, was the chief disciple of Plotinus and he kind of wrote a scathing, uh, a scathing essay on um, on the nature, sort of the nature of the gods, and how he wrote plainly that like blood sacrifice only attracts like bad beings, like bad spirits. And if you read that, it's like he's really condemning the earlier tradition because uh, most of the old pagan religions were all about blood sacrifice. That was like the prime ritual for quite a long time. Was um, you know, you you kill your your meat before you eat it and sprinkle blood all over the altar while doing an invocation to the deity that that, that you know animal is being offered up to. So he says plainly in this piece that it's just yeah, you're um, any god or any spirit or whatever who would demand a blood sacrifice first of all isn't a god. He uses the term daimon, which just means spirit. That's the word that later kind of semantically drifted into demon in Christianity. Though mm -hmm. in, in the original Greek, it's a neutral term. You could be a good, bad, or neutral spirit. It doesn't necessarily mean an evil demon. Yeah, so, so the late, his demon. Yeah, right, right, his da daimon. Uh, so, yeah, the later Neoplatonists take a, they take a more ambivalent posture towards towards the gods. And some are kind of seem outright hostile towards the traditional practices. And it's it actually mirrors in Hinduism the kind of the shift away from the uh, the the older the, the older like uh, burnt offerings and animal sacrifice practices that was basically like you know Hinduism in the late Bronze Age and throughout much of the Iron Age. Yeah, well, even as late as um, Rome, you had like the the concept of the Pax Deorum, where it's you're, you're trying to organize society in such a way that you know the gods will approve and and bless you. Some, something like that. But right. I think it was like a uh, goal of the state religion more than of the individual. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah, it's kind of a sort of imperial consolidation of all the earlier cults from, you know, Roman prehistory on up. Yeah. So why is it, do you suppose, that um, we've got the, it, it strikes me as kind of surprising and ironic that, classical paganism is largely ignored by the modern west who is turning away from christianity and looking for something maybe more western 
more indigenously European or some such. They're they're ignoring the classical, you know, like Julian type of paganism and looking towards, you know, the Germanic people mostly, you know, Thor and Woden and that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, I mean, that is common. There, There is, so within neo-paganism, a term I just use for all modern pagan practice, uh, there is a there is a Hellenic element. There, there are people who call themselves Hellenists, so that's definitely a subset of it. But yeah, I can see, I, I definitely agree, there seems to be more of a broad appeal to the Germanic, Germanic paganism for obvious reasons, you know, in Anglophone countries, we speak English as a Germanic language, so the next logical step is, well, uh, that's the ancestral culture to us is the Germanic peoples. And then there's obviously, there, there's some people who get into Germanic paganism for identitarian reasons, and some I believe actually, you know, kind of misuse it for that. Uh, and then, yeah, then you get other, um, I like to call sort of the, the leftoid end of neo-paganism that's into Germanic stuff, which seems kind of weird, but... Uh, a lot of them, like people watch Marvel comics and see like Thor and Loki. And so they're, oh, cool. You can actually like set up an altar and like worship these guys and maybe they'll do some favors for me. So you get, you get that, I guess that kind of angle too. Yeah. So, so yeah, that makes sense that the Germanic people, including the English would uh, prefer Germanic paganism, which would seem to imply that uh, Southern Europeans would be more inclined towards the classical paganism but I've, I've been exposed to very little of that i've I, I joined the julian society long ago but they don't seem to do anything so i i'm still get their yeah. newsletters occasionally but um i mean they don't seem to actually be doing anything towards setting up an organized more or less julian neoplatonist pagan system yeah i don't know how organized so the- it would be you know it's like I don't think there would be any universally recognized, you know, high priest of Jupiter or 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 Zeus or anything like that, would there? No, no. The the, the thing is, <laughs> this is the running joke here because a lot of a lot of neo pagans come from let's just say the more affluent end of society, meaning like the middle, like the white collar middle class and up. Yet they can't even build a freaking temple anywhere. It's kind of a joke. It's because the whole. This is now this is going to be similar to Western secular Buddhism, too, which actually, I, in my opinion, these two things emerged out of the same the same period in culture. Basically, the 60s counterculture, we had these alternative spiritualities getting going. And a lot of people joined these because it was something not Christian and it was novel too. like nobody was war had been worshiping page, pagan gods for like a long time, obviously, or like partaking in an Eastern Eastern religion. Uh, so yeah, these people, it was kind of this new, it was part of the whole countercultural movement. So there was obviously like this progressive leftist sort of cultural undercurrent to the whole thing the whole time. So one, one of the byproducts of that is specifically ne- neo-paganism is that it is, everything is so hyper individualistic. It's all about what can this supposed religion do for me, the individual, not like what I can do to make myself, uh, in service to the divine or use the religion like the old pagan cults to, to use it to, to build a community. So it's just all this narcissistic, like boomer, me, me, me sort of mentality that was the, the foundation of the whole thing. So now you get like, you know, people who have some money and they're like, oh, I worship Jupiter and this person I worship Thor. But obviously it's fragmented into different sub traditions and the people within the same one still can't agree on anything and like, put anything together to build something like a temple or even like a even like a local congregation that gets together regularly besides some seasonal festival yeah yeah there is actually uh supposedly i haven't been there yet but in nashville tennessee not too far from here there's supposedly uh, an exact replica of the uh the parthenon oh yeah yeah Yeah, a friend who just visited there yeah yeah it's quite impressive i've seen pictures yeah, yeah, it looks good. Yeah, um, one would wonder why there, I don't know if there's like any local pagans actually gather there and, you know, burn some incense and do yeah, some. Yeah, I think like local pagans, if they're going to be gathering somewhere, they're going to find something resembling Stonehenge or something. That's kind of the, the impression I get. Yeah, it, yeah. It is kind of ironic to me that one of the, the original purposes of um, you know, pre-modern religions was just to unify the people, give them the same set of values and the same world views so that which strengthens the society. Whereas now yeah. it's all atomized. 
Buddhism, yep. same way. It's like you find one or two, you know, this in this neighborhood maybe, and, you know, <laughs> a few over there. And, you know, it's just completely scattered. And any kind of community is going to be uh, digital pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's funny the parallels between these two things. So uh, let's say you're in a city and you gather all anyone who's into like Buddhism together. So the problem is you're going to have like this, I'm into Zen, the next person, I'm into Theravada, the next person, I like Pure Land, the next person, I, oh, I, yeah, I do Tibetan, like, uh, mandala practices or something like that. I mean, that's it's the same thing as the fragmentation within the pagan community. It's like, I'm into this pantheon, no, I'm into that pantheon. It's just so fragmented. And as I said, when you get people who are even into the same practice, they still can't agree on anything. Or, you know, people just want to run off and do their own thing. And it's basically becomes an expression of their own personality quirks or their own like internal imbalances or something just manifests in whatever they think they're doing. That's spirituality. You know, nothing's like really grounded in any kind of tradition at all. Yeah. I mean, by the time Europe or the West became predominantly Roman, I mean, even even paganism, you know, Roman paganism was very diverse. You know, there's all sorts of different cults. And, you know, one person, you know, I worship Isis and the next person, you know, I'm, I'm a staunch follower of Jupiter. And, you know, there's all yeah. but, but at least it was integrated into one system. It might have been very loosely yeah. integrated, but at least, you know, had the sanction of, of the, the Roman Senate or the, the, the what is it, the College of. Uh, what were they? College of Pontiffs, I think. Yeah, yeah. The name. yeah. Something like that. So at least there was some sort of binding agent, you know, and, and nowadays it's, yeah. um, we're in such an individualist age, I guess. You know, we've been atomized down to a completely alienated individual practically that, um, yeah, as one wonders what it would take to actually get things back on track spiritually. But um, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> I've <laughs> agonized talking. over this question a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, my only I'm pretty black pilled on that, like actual paganism working as like a cultural unifying factor. I think that's something that just tends to grow organically from within a culture with a homogenous ethnic identity. And it's something that takes centuries of people living on the land. A lot of it's people having a more just organic existence and communing with the actual numinous powers of the land and the celestial powers that sort of coincide with that. And that's just many centuries of just cumulative spiritual experience that leads to what would be an authentic pagan tradition versus today where just people are just importing these old dead traditions from, from the other side of the ocean. Yeah. And not really having, we don't have the lived experience to understand the everyday, you know, Greek, pagan, Roman, pagan, Norse, pagan, whatever, Celtic, whatever experience. These are just long divorced from what we actually do in our daily lives. So then, of course, it's the normal thing. We're just Western. They impose all these intellectual abstractions on everything, and which more often than not, it's just modern secular ideology, as, as you're well used to in the circles you've, you've dealt with. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to me that most pagans, um, you know, with no blatant disrespect, are, are LARPing, essentially. It's, yep. They're going with replicas. Yeah, that's what it is. It's a, it's a replica. It's a lot of just make believe and dressing up in funny costumes. Yeah. So you wanted to discuss the decline and fall. I mean, we've already mentioned the the leftist element, the progressive leftism, sort of um, working its way into these ancient traditions. In fact, they they are largely uh, responsible for founding these traditions in the West. I mean, certainly. Uh, Buddhism is that way, you know, it goes back to the, the beatniks in the late 50s and then the, the hippies, uh, it, they were more into Hinduism, I think, but still it was uh, largely, uh, you know, a, just a product of that generation of just, yeah. Being, yeah, just they wanted to be different from their parents and their parents were Christians, so they're looking for something different. And maybe also to some degree, you know, they're dropping acid and so forth and having mystical states that, you uh, uh, in some ways are more compatible with with the Eastern meditative or yogic traditions than uh, the kind of Protestant Christianity that is prevalent mm -hmm. in the West that is pretty much just abandoned any kind of contemplative traditions. Yeah, I think that's a great summary right there of how, how this whole 
alternative spirituality scene sort of started. What actually was really the second start of it. The first would be the Theosophical Society in the late 19th century. This is really what brought Eastern spirituality into the West in, in a way where it wasn't just trying to be like denounced as being like something the devil came up with because that, that was what Orientalism was prior to like these Western scholars just being kind of very dismissive of, of Eastern traditions because it wasn't literalist Protestant Christianity. But yeah, the, the, the Theosophical Society brought a lot of the stuff and even the neo-pagan stuff we can trace back to some of the work that we did or that that, that they did rather. Um, and then it all bubbled back up. It, it sort of died out in like the 30s and 40s and then bubbled back up in the late 60s. Yeah, there was around that same time, it was like the late 1800s, there was a kind of upsurge of spirituality in the West, which I consider to be largely a reaction against Darwinism. You know, it's where yeah. he pretty much drove the the, the nail. And <laughs> I mean, you know, he explained why we're why and how humans are here in a more or less scientific way, which pretty much pulled the last rug out from underneath the creationists. And there was, in a way, it was like a spiritual reaction with all the the spiritualism and the the faith healing mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. Rama Krishna also was uh, significant, not as maybe not as influential as the Theosophists, but he was kind of a big deal in the late 1800s. And then you had like people like, uh, uh, who were, the, what's his name? Uh, you know, the transcendentalists in like the the late 1800s. Like um, oh yeah, Ralph yeah. Waldo uh, Emerson and those guys. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. they kind of set a little bit of a of a foundation for for later later developments. But in That's a way, it's true. Was, Very true. Yeah, but in a way, it's like a progressive kind of a thing that really, um, it's just kind of ironic that they're trying to, um, I mean, there's like this progressivism and really non-spiritual kind of atheistic Marxism is responsible for bringing in these ancient, you know, venerated traditions that are just doomed at the hands of, you know, secular materialistic progressives. Yeah, yeah. And that, yeah, there's a reason too why a lot of these movements fizzled out because these were people we would consider to be very progressive at, um, during that time period, bringing these bringing these traditions in, but yeah, they have that the progressive mindset. It's hard to sustain anything as a tradition when you're just constantly moving from one novelty to the next. Yeah. So you were wanting to uh, discuss this decline and fall. If there's anything you haven't mentioned that you would like to, you're certainly welcome to. I have uh, my very short list of questions here. Sure. Uh, almost exhausted, except for one one question I haven't asked yet is uh, uh, like, does like hermeticism and alchemy have any place in in your your spirituality or your uh, your study? Oh, very much. Yeah, very much so. Um, that's so. What I, what I, the the occultism I study is basically like modern. I guess you can call it modern hermeticism, for lack of any other term, uh, and. You know, we like some of us like to come up with fanciful lineages that go way back in history. That obviously, you know, I, I'm a, I'm an Anglo-Saxon empiricist in some ways as much as the next guy over. <laughs> so I don't like to make these hard claims, but um, yeah, it's basically the traditions that go all the way back to the mystery schools of ancient of ancient Greece. That you know, Pythagoras and Orpheus. It kind of starts with them and goes through Platonism, and then. Has to hide, you know, gets has to hide when when Christianity comes on the scene and then resurfaces in the Renaissance. Uh, a lot of uh, occult teachings that were pres actually preserved in Judaism and Islam. Islam is actually strangely enough was tolerant to certain traditions more than than we might think. Um, and then in, in Judaism too, it was easy to hide stuff in there because it, it, it's its version of orthodoxy is not the same as like Christian. But anyways, the stuff it was wealthy, um, wealthy Italian nobility in the in the 1400s and 1500s who sort of reimported this lost knowledge back into the West from a lot of it was from uh, from Constantinople, the very end of the Byzantine Empire, when the Turks were basically just erasing it from existence. 
So yeah. a lot the, the the Greek the uh, the Byzantine Greeks kept so much old esoteric knowledge and philosophy just hidden in these libraries. They didn't burn it all. They just kept it locked up. So the Turks were like sacking Constantinople. These wealthy Greeks and like um, Venetians and Italians basically raided the libraries and brought it back. And some of this was like financed by um, the, the like the de Medici family. So all of a sudden you had all this hidden esoteric knowledge just coming back into Europe. And a lot of that is what spurned, spurned the Renaissance. And then, you know, it sort of carried on. Uh, it got up into Northern Europe too. There was, um, there was an, es after the, during the Protestant Reformation, there was an esoteric German Protestant movement known as the Rosicrucians who mixed this esoteric knowledge with, with Christianity. And that's kind of what preserved up, up into the modern era when it, it got, uh, in the late 19th century, with the whole theosophical things, esoteric wisdom finally started getting de-Christianized. And so now we have this knowledge that we can kind of employ and use. You can use it in a pagan context, or you can blend it with other teachings. So it's not like so dependent on Christianity anymore. So the alchemy, I mean, you set aside trying to find the philosopher's stone, trying to turn base metals into gold. And I mean, what kind of spiritual practices would be found in alchemy itself. So this is what trip this is kind of what trips up people who are new into this. They assume it's a material pursuit, like you're literally trying to turn lead into gold. When this was kind of an outer covering the alchemists used to keep basically the prying Catholic inquisitors away from what they were actually doing. They had to hide these things. So the the alchemy process is actually purely allegorical. It's the transmutation of the soul from this low, degraded, just material earthbound quality up into basically various states of spiritual realization. So it's comparable to like in the Hindu system of ascending from the lower chakras up, up to the top ones and basically purifying your soul and, you know, breaking the breaking the cycle of, of rebirth. Nice. And so that was taught like as far back as ancient times i think the orpheus like the orpheus cult had some of that you know just transcending the world and going beyond it yeah I mean, all the exactly. all the genuine mystery traditions basically that was the central goal of what they taught was just the various methods of of spiritual transcendence yeah and it, it is kind of sad that it's all um vestigial now mm. Yeah, although it's, you know, now all the knowledge is, you know, all the surface knowledge of these practices are back now. So anyone can pick up books and, you know, uh, practice practice various esoteric arts. Yeah, and, for the time being, although it seems to me that, I mean, we've been talking about, you know, ancient times, and it seems like we're sort of getting to a, a replay of, like, 4th century Rome, where mm -hmm. you've got this progressive movement that is hysterically intolerant, that's just trying to destroy all opposition. And yeah, um, yeah we're, we're kind of coming into that. Sort into of the decline and fall, precisely what this is. How the, the, the left is basically invaded and try to subvert all of these, whether it's a neo-occultism, neo-paganism, obviously uh, Eastern practices, they just try to invade everything and uh, make make everything just all about diversity equity and inclusion you know the, the unholy trinity yeah. rather than about the actual the actual spiritual practices yeah it's really astonishing because most of these people are you know relatively intelligent educated people as you've said it's mostly the more or less intellectual types that are drawn to uh, esoteric traditions including you know like buddhist contemplative traditions and they just do they just fail to see that most of the genuine dharma or whatever the spiritual essence of the tradition is is just being supplanted by leftist talking points yeah so yeah i think a lot of the people are just ignorant of this and who belong to these groups and they kind of just got caught up in this hysteria but there are definitely bad actors people who are deliberately subverting these groups and they're cynical and they know exactly what they're doing yeah, and they tend to be predominantly academics, as far as I can tell. At least that's the way it is in Theravada Buddhism, where you've oh, yeah. got academics who are, you know, they got a degrees in, degree in religious studies, and they specialize in queer theory and ancient polytexts or this kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, 
Yeah, definitely. That's kind of the sociological component at play here is that in these alternative spiritualities, these are primarily people from what we call the managerial class, so the, the white collar middle class. And within that, you could, the academics are like the Brahmin layer of the top, you know, the top layer of uh, of this whole managerial class. And they're the ones basically just dictating what the ideology is that everybody else in this social grouping is supposed to believe in. So, you know, you have somebody, you know, whether it's in a so-called Sangha or a neo-pagan group, they're also like probably at least two degrees of separation away from academia, if not in it itself. So their job, their career is always on the line. They're angling for that promotion to a tenured professor or whatever. Uh, it's become brutally, uh, what's the term I'm looking for, within these institutions, cutthroat, where you're just constantly trying to, you're trying to edge the other person out from like taking your position or being a, com a competitor to being promoted to the next, next level of professor or whatever. So you have to, you know, that's where the whole virtue signaling game comes in. It's kind of this weaponization of caddy office politics where you have to virtue signal harder than your next peer in academia. And then it just spirals out of control and it just any any organization or group that's culturally adjacent to academia just gets polluted with all this crap. Yeah. Yeah, it is kind of is it just kind of strange that it would uh, even go as far as you know Neoplatonism, but I mean it's not really surprising. But uh, still, well, in a way, it is kind of surprising. But when then you stop to think about it, and it's like, nah, it's not surprising. It's just everything they're just uh, trying to homogenize the culture along leftist <laughs> lines. It seems like. Yeah, I mean the other thing too is like probably at least ninety percent of people actually interested in Neoplatonism today are. They're either in academia or they're in that same cultural bubble. So they're naturally they're just gonna be polluting it with all, you know, the stuff we've been talking about. Yeah, and unfortunately for you, you can't just uh go to a monastery and find the people still following the, the traditional culture. Yeah, we got we have nothing. <laughs> yeah, There's like nothing to work with here. You know, it's just it's all it's all just doing whatever study or practice in your in your bedroom or living room or whatever. That's it. So you really being realistic, you wouldn't see any future other than as a fringe movement for Neoplatonism or or any kind of like hermetic hermeticism or anything like that. Well, I, I think that I think the occult stuff will survive that that always tends to survive in one way or another because it's just very, it's it's very adaptable. It's not. It's not tethered to like fixed outer forms like exoteric religions are. Those those can sometimes die when a culture really changes or collapses or something. So I think the esoteric occult stuff will survive. But I think that the neo paganism, I think it's just it's been going down the toilet, which actually leads us into the whole fall and decline of 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 neo paganism, which kind of started in the early 2010s. Is the general culture was just switching to, to this obsession with politics. Around then, especially around like uh, 2012, 2013, well, more like 2014 is when you see all like the woke stuff starting to creep into the mainstream, but it wasn't really metastatic yet at that point. That's where you start like seeing like the anti like SJW YouTube channels coming up and talking yeah. about this stuff, you know. Uh, but so what really did it was, of course, the, the year of 2016 when the big bad, the big bad orange man somehow won the vote many yeah. people are still scratching their heads they don't understand what could possibly supposed to yeah so it this was like this is like in my view is like a spear in the side of the managerial class who fancy themselves as being more wise and enlightened because they're just ever progressive and they know better than everybody else they're also the you know technocratic in the way they function so like Everything they figure they can just engineer society with some set of procedures and everyone else is just supposed to magically follow along with their dictates. So suddenly the big bad orange man is in office and they can't figure out for the life of them why this happened. They can't. They're so caught up in their own cultural sphere. They don't realize that, like, you know, the 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 the, the working classes and other groups have just been being screwed by these globalistic neoliberal policies for, for decades now. So just yeah. completely outside their perception zone. So all they can do is come up with their arch evil devil figure, the orange man. I mean, it's just the orange man's evil orange Hitler, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, the people caught up in these alt spiritualities, this is their complete 
mental space now is just just projecting all their inner turmoil on the orange man. And so then spirituality just becomes a total afterthought among these people. So at the same time, um, I like to do is I look up different blogs of people within the neo-pagan spaces. You'll see around this time, the blog posts just start falling off. And there's only a periodic post someone will make, and it's just entirely about like woke shit or about opposing Trump. And no talk about the gods or the divine or spirituality or teachings or any, anything like that. Yeah, when actually Trump, I mean, he was more of a uh, more of an ancient archetype of a guy than a, like more of a like a modern leader. I mean, he's more of the the old, uh, you know, like uh, Victor Davis, David Hansen. Victor Davis Hansen compares him to uh, Alcibiades, you know, just <laughs> sort of this outrageous, I mean, heroic in a certain way, but also just a total rascal in other ways and, and just kind of beloved of the gods for some ironic, mysterious reason. Yeah, um, in, in my own occult circles, there's actually, um, so there's a there's a renowned author who actually, he's kind of a sort of a mentor for what I do. His name's John Michael Greer. He writes a lot of good stuff. He wrote this book called The King in Orange that gets into all the occult aspects of Trump's rise to power. And basically, he shows a, a kind of collective archetype just manifested in him. So it's implying that these like kind of supernatural forces are manifesting in this figure and sort of driving this necessary change in basically a society that's like about to go off a cliff, culturally speaking. Yeah, it is interesting. At least as a Buddhist, I do have like, uh, you know, well well established tradition i can fall back on to, to a large degree i can just ignore the the loony academic left yeah. their attempts to just turn turn buddhism or dharma into just a kind of buddhism flavored leftism right yeah yeah you're, you're good in that and obviously buddhism isn't going anywhere you know all the fakers and people are just doing it for other superficial reasons yeah they'll they'll leave or they'll subvert it, their little groups to death, but the tradition itself will be there, even if it's just a small core of committed committed seekers and aesthetics keeping it on. It'll yeah, still it's still gonna go. Populations in Asia. Yeah. Plus, you you have in in your particular tradition, you have like one of the largest, just most vol massive scriptural corpuses, at least that 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 I've seen through my survey of different traditions. Yeah. Yeah. It's like forty volumes in the Burmese. Burmese. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that, that I, I think that really says something, you know, if you have that much of I know, obviously, a spiritual tra traditions more than it's written materials, but still, it says something for the just the volume of teachings that have, that, you know, that have accumulated within that system. Yeah, well, that's just the canonical stuff. There's also like a, a massive commentarial tradition, not in, not even including the, the library of texts that the Mahayana Buddhists have churned out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Very true. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I see the merit and kind of sort of pick it if you're like seriously a spiritual seeker seeking out some kind of tradition that has longevity to it. Yeah, it's been around a while. Yeah, but the, the stuff I do, it's mostly a lot of ancient sources and, you know, sort of modern expansions of it, but it's quite voluminous. You know, I don't as I said, I don't think that's going to I don't think that's going to ever die out fully. Yeah. So your practice is essentially just solitary then. Yeah, it is. I, I don't even know how I'd go about finding anybody else in the area I live in who would be interested in the same stuff I'm doing. Yeah, I can sympathize with that. I mean, even as a Theravada Buddhist, even though, you know, there's literally, you know, tens of millions of us in the world, um, I was just solitary until I actually went to the monastery to become a monk. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I'm also afraid of seeking out. And the, the problem is most people who are attracted to anything with the word occult on it are just the totally wrong kind of people. They're they're looking for like spooky, like, you know, um, stupid, like witchcraft or sorcery yeah. or just like Ouija, bad. Board, Ouija boards and seances and stuff. <laughs> yeah, spiritualism. <laughs> I actually was thinking recently how... A lot of this stuff is just if you like neo paganism and a lot of neo occultism together, it's kind of just a rehash of spiritualism. Just naive people trying to communicate and dip their toes into the spiritual realm without really any idea of what they're doing or who they're actually communicating with. 
Yeah, my father was somewhat of an occultist, although he was more into the witchcraft angle, just hypnosis and past life regressions and experiments, uh, paranormal and, and that sort of thing. He wasn't, uh, he, I don't think he ever really mentioned much about, uh, you know, classical, any, anything classical, really. Yeah, I mean, that sounds, whatever time period he was studying that in, it's probably that the classical stuff wasn't really, I guess, in vogue around yeah. then. So, like, if, if someone is just interested in, like, classical paganism, what would you suggest as, like, an introduction or, you know, a good, a good text to start with or any kind of practice to start with, anything like that? Well, I mean, I, I, would, I would personally recommend a few, you know, Plato's dialogues, but um, your average person just isn't interested in philosophy, so they, they would probably just run away right then and maybe not pursue it if I was giving that particular advice. But I mean, um, it's uh, obviously tradition dependent. If someone's interested in the Hellenic Greek stuff, obviously just reading the foundational stuff would be the the, the hymns of like uh, Homer and Hesiod and the Orphic hymns, stuff like that. Just reading, you know, getting into the mythology, that, that sort of angle. Just as like somebody interested in the Germanic paganism would, would read the read the Eddas, that would be their like their source to go to. Yeah. Yeah, I just get the impression that uh, even most sincere pagans, um, I think it would be really hard for them to have, you know, just deep faith in like Athena, for example. You know, just, you know, like completely dedicate their, their become a votary, you know, a devotee of, of Athena or, you know, Dionysus or something. I assume yeah. people like that. But Yeah, you know, there are, there are, definitely it, it, there are. Yeah, they'd have to take it as kind of figurative or like an allegory or something. Yeah, so there's several approaches there. There's definitely a devotional end of neo-paganism. Um, and, you know, most of them actually believe it's a real being they're supposedly communicating with. I don't doubt that they're communicating with a spirit. Maybe a few people lie about it just to get attention on the Internet. But um, the thing is, though, with um, this is just through the occult stuff I've learned is that when you when you go when you communicate with a you know a spiritual entity, uh, they often they interface psychically, so they can manifest in any appearance they want, especially if they're a more advanced being. So you know you could be praying out to Athena or Apollo or something. What you get could just be some, some spirit manifesting in that particular form. And on that, I subscribe to the general idea when people reach out to the spirit realm, generally what they're going to get in response is something that roughly corresponds to their own kind of state of consciousness. So you know, let's say I'm just going to use the worst example possible, the blue haired, overweight, just perpetually angry woman drinks a lot of boxed wine. Maybe she's like praying to a goddess or something. It's like what I mean, what, what would that state of consciousness attract? I guess that's kind of maybe asking a rhetorical question here. Yeah. Yeah, as for myself, I mean, something like prayer, I'm not sure where prayer would fit in. I, I assume a lot of pagans do practice prayer. But as for myself, I mean, I am relatively skeptical. So, I mean, even at the times when I've been in such desperation that I have actually prayed just spontaneously, it's just to anyone out there who is able and willing to help, you know, I, I'm not specifying any particular being. It's just anyone out there. Yeah. And that work that that works. That actually works a lot of the time. Like if you're yeah. especially your heart felt about it, some something will someone I like to I think they are persons will will respond. So what do you feel about uh, like Socrates had his daimon? Do you think it's it's like a like a guardian spirit almost, right? Mm -hmm. And then yes. in Burma, they talk about the Kosantnat, which is like the, the deva who is like your, your guardian spirit. So I yes. assume there's, there's uh, some element of that in like classical paganism. Oh, yeah, definitely. The, the guardian spirit, yeah, you definitely find that in there. And I, that's it, as your example just illustrates, it's really a cross-cultural phenomena, which, you know, the way I sort of build my own beliefs is when I see things that are kind of repeated cross culture, I'm inclined to accept that as a real thing. Yeah. Like Bigfoot too. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a whole other, uh, 
Maybe that's one for your uh, friend Brian to join in on. But yeah, yeah. All right. Well, uh, we've been going at it surprisingly for almost fifty minutes, which is uh, surprising yeah. to me. It really flew. Yeah. There's no <laughs> kind of no shortage of stuff to talk about on these topics. Yeah. So if there, I mean, if there's anything you'd like to uh, close off with, you know, to uh, to end this, you're you're welcome to have your say. I think we covered. Uh, I think we pretty much covered. Going through my notes right now, I think we actually covered. I didn't even glance at them once, and we covered a lot of the things that I was jotting down here. Oh, one more thing. This is. I want to leave it on a kind of humorous note. If you're uh, praying, reaching out to a god, and they parrot your political ideology back at you, uh, it's probably a red flag. Red flag? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Or they just pander. They just reflect. They reflect like your own beliefs or narcissism or something back at you. That probably means they're they're kind of a on the grubbier end of of the spirit realm. Yeah. Or if if they speak in uh, hardly intelligible language where you've got to like make sense of what they're saying is like very vague, sort of like the Delphic oracles in a way. I mean, I'd be right. a little leery of that also. Yeah, I would stay the heck as far away from that as possible unless like you have a lineage that knows how to <laughs> work with that sort of force or sort of intelligence. Yeah, that's something to something to steer clear of. In general, what I do is we have um, we have certain uh, rituals we use that that basically chase away any kind of like demonic or hostile power and only assumes that like more benevolent energies or forces or whatever can get through in the practice. That's the responsible people, in my opinion, do when they engage in these kind of practices. How about trickster forces? Like the like the god Loki or the the, the coyote yeah. archetype or something yeah, like something that. Yeah, something like that. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't. I see. I think this one doesn't require when when you're trying to like ritualistically work with a god or a force. I don't think it requires many IQ points to figure what would happen when you when you connect with one of those kind of beings, you know, that there that might not be uh, forthcoming or you know truthful about what their what their intentions on answering your prayer or call is. Yeah, I'm just one reason I brought that up is one of the most in, important books I've read recently is the Trickster and the Paranormal, where he's just saying that any kind of paranormal you know, like supernatural phenomena is going to have trickster phenomena just inseparably combined with it. You know, it's, it, it, like the paranormal manifests in this world through breaking rules or, or just, you know, like making it through cracks between the rules, that sort of thing. And so there's always going to be some kind of trickster element involved, some kind of chaotic uncertainty or, or something, something along those lines. Oh yeah, there's definitely definitely something to that too, and I could see both with uh, with the Trillahole Orange or Orange Savior phenomena and with the whole Keck thing too. I think yeah. there was a trick trickster element, and I think really that was the supernatural kind of. I hate to actually use that term, but uh, the numinous sort of punching into our reality and sort of uh, <laughs> giving us some clues as to what's going on and, and what's manifesting. Uh, yeah. I actually would go on that probably. Uh, I know you've watched uh, Sticks, Hex, and Hammer videos. He's made a lot of videos on that particular topic in the past, and he has like a whole occult series where he goes yeah. into that sort of stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess we're done then, and I appreciate it, and maybe we can uh, talk again sometime. Yeah, I'd love to. All right. Thanks for having me.